Rob. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Good morning. Sabbath. I'm going to share something. And we will explore an interesting topic that it's, I believe it's probably not very fun for uh, uh, people to hear, but I think it's very important as the time that we live in. And uh, before that, let's uh, have a short prayer and then we'll continue. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, to listen to your word. We thank you for your blessings of life, of opportunity to be well, to be healthy, and be able to come and worship you. Please give us your spirit as we explore the verses in the Bible and we read commentaries and help us to understand your message. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we look at two types of wretchedness. So probably you have heard what wretchedness is, although it only shows up a couple of times in the Greek language in the New Testament. And um, you will probably think that if it just shows up only twice, why would there be two types of wretchedness? And uh, if you will read those verses and we'll see. But um, I found this connected to the message to the uh, Laodicea. And uh, if you remember, maybe a couple of months ago, we explored uh, a little bit kind of introduction of the topic of shaking. And it's very interesting that the topic of shaking it's occurs in the time of Laodicea. So maybe you have uh, read the Revelation, book of Revelation. We're going to read it in a bit. And we know that the uh, beginning of the book of Revelation Jesus uh, has message toward the seven churches, which were real churches in the time of Jesus. There were seven real churches and seven real uh, towns in the uh, Roman Empire, which was somewhere in the Middle East. Um, and the last one that we know is the book of uh, the Church of Laodicea, which we know through the book of Revelation is the last, last church that exists historically also, these seven churches cover the periods of time for the uh, Church of Christ since he is coming, uh, spreading till the last days. So if you have gone into reading about that and you know a little bit about of Laodicea, you may think that because the Laodicea is related to the uh, lukewarm state, Jesus has a very kind of bad comment on her and we will read let's read before that the uh, verses from Revelation 3 14 to 19 and we'll be able to <clears throat> to see what it talks about verse 14 and to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write these things says the amen the faithful and true witness the beginning of creation of God 15, I know your works, that you are neither cold or, nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched. Here's the first place we see the text. That's the second, because it's the last book of the Bible. And... Do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. So if you... If you remember, or if you uh, listen to a sermon about the book of Laodicea, if you've heard, most of the times we talk that the Laodicea is lukewarm, because that was the town where the Laodicean church was um, uh, that existed. It had a hot spring, and uh, we know that they were rich. We know that they were, uh, they had water. The problem is that the hot water was coming from up, down, from, from up, 
going down to the city and while while it's traveling to the city it becomes lukewarm it's not hot anymore so maybe you heard we talk a lot about that but if you don't know that the Laodicea doesn't really mean lukewarm many people will think that lukewarm that Laodicea means lukewarm but Laodicea actually means people that are judged so is the last church is also we know we can actually through prophecy we're not going to go there outlines the time when the last church of Laodicea starts historically which is prophetically no it's 1844 when the judgment in heaven starts and Jesus moves from the most holy from the holy to the most holy place in the sanctuary in heaven so we're not going to go into that because today I want us to explore only practically one word and this is the one and in red there and if you see that the message really the core of the message when you read in details is what the church says about itself what the church of Laodicea or the people who are judged which is us we live at that historical time and that prophetic time when judgment is happening in heaven that's the last church and if you look at it, the core of the message is the people say one thing but Jesus tells them another thing and what this is it does verse 17 that uh, you have read before I am rich have become wealthy and have need of nothing but Jesus is actually who is speaking here the true witness is telling them totally opposite you do not even know that you are wretched miserable poor blind and naked and you can explore a lot into the rest of the words here uh, miserable poor blind and naked we have talked more or less on some of these things but I found that very few times we talk about the word wretched uh, when you think about it wretched we have to probably look uh, a little bit more and this is from the book early writings from Ellen G White who says something very interesting which is related to the time of the shaking which we know will happen right before the last day events start occurring on the on this planet all the turmoil all the disasters all the troubles that's going to accelerate and uh, we can just read it she says i asked the meaning of the shaking i had seen and it was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called for by the council of the true witness to the laodiceans we already read in revelation that's the true witness is jesus and if you go to revelation chapter one i believe verse five he says that this is the the uh, testimony of jesus the book of revelation that's how he starts so of the true witness to the loudest sense this will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth some will not bear this straight testimony they will rise up against it and this is what will cause a shaking among God's people I saw that the testimony of the true witness has not been half heeded the solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed if not entirely disregarded this testimony must work deep repentance all who truly receive it will obey it and be purified and there is a lot in here but it's uh, one thing to me that you can see repeats more and more its testimony and we know that who is who is doing testimonies usually when you think about a testimony or when you think about a witness you think about court and that's exactly matches the situation of the last day church it's the judgment in heaven it's not that Jesus is being judged but we are being judged we are not going to go into prophecy now but he is the true witness who is witnessing practically against us and want us to to change and it's very interesting here that um, if you read carefully this passage you will see that whoever receives it, it's going to have an effect upon the heart of the people and that's going to divide the people because they don't want to accept it and it's also in the second or third sentence here it, this will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth and there are other places uh, I don't remember it was in this book early writings but talks about that right when this happens 
then the church will be able to proclaim with full power, receiving the Holy Spirit and proclaim the coming of Jesus, which is the the three angels' messages, which are still being proclaimed, but the, also the fourth angel's message. So this message is very important, the message of wretchedness. And um, the second place where this appears in Romans 7, and we are not going to go into details on that too, but you've heard that's the Paul's experience about struggling with keeping the law and being led by the Spirit. And I want us to read only a few verses here. Romans 7, 18 to 23, that's the New International Version, has a little bit better translation because, as you know, Paul is kind of going a lot of uh, poetically back and forth. Uh, and if you read it in the King James Version, you will you may get confused, but NIV is really good. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me prisoner of the law of sin at work with me. So it's it's a lot of back and forth, the law of sin and the law of the flesh, which is also the law of sin. And to me, wanting to do God's, wanting to keep the law, but not able. And there is more to it but this is the other place where the word wretched appears so um, the problem that paul has is and he explains here is he's trying to keep the law by himself and in some of the translations if you look um, we will see uh, later romans 7 it continues 24 and 25 so what a wretched man i am he exclaims who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. So there is a lot to it, but the only thing it's, which pertains to what we're trying to explore today is that this is the same wretchedness. If you think about it, it's the same wretchedness. And uh, if you look at the uh, some of the commentaries or the definitions here, you can see that in the Bible, the word wretched generally refers to a state of deep suffering, misery, or moral corruption. It describes someone who is in a pitiable condition, often because of sin or spiritual brokenness. The term is used to express an awareness of one's hopelessness or unworthiness apart from God's grace and mercy. So you may think that this is the same. Yes, it is the same, but it's actually different because in the book of Revelation, what we have is Jesus wants them to have this feeling of wretchedness, but the church of Laodicea actually doesn't have it. The church of Laodicea feels that it's rich, that it's spiritually rich, and obviously we know it doesn't talk about real riches because later he says, you just, I advise you to go and buy gold. If it was that, all of us should be just trading gold. We should accumulate as much gold and we should be fine. But we know that it's about spiritual nakedness, spiritual wretchedness. But the problem with the Laodicean church is the Laodicean church doesn't have it. The Laodicean church, uh, Jesus wants it to have this type of wretchedness, but the Laodicean church doesn't have it. And to me, that is the core, really, of the problem, and that's what the true witness, which is Jesus himself, says it's going to happen to his church if they don't heed to this warning. The warning is, you're not really wretched. And uh, you can probably imagine what, what's going to happen to you if you, uh, I mean, the uh, true witness says that you're naked, so have you seen anybody go on the street naked? I mean, I don't know if you've seen anybody, but probably you will say something is wrong with him. I mean, uh, and, and for example, you say, hey, man, you're naked. 
What's gonna happen? Say, hey man, don't you know you don't have clothes? Like, I have clothes. I mean, don't you think something is kind of wrong? If you say, totally naked, or let's say, have underwear. And you, and you will say, look at my pants, look at my shirt. I mean, I know it sounds crazy, maybe, but that's what exactly is happening. That's what the true witness is saying. You are naked. I mean, you, you are the most wretched. Look at you. But he says, nope, I have clothes. I'm rich. I'm, I have everything I need. What are you talking about? So the problem really is not the concept of wretchedness. The problem is that Paul, for example, in his experience, he realized his wretchedness. But the church of Laodicea doesn't realize it doesn't realize that it have the righteousness of Jesus. So in Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10, we have this, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it? And verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So Jeremiah, and in other places of the Bible, uh, Solomon talks a little bit about that, that, the human heart is really deceitful. And the problem is that we can fall into that same situation. And if we believe what, what the true witness is saying to the church of Laodicea, that must mean that most of us probably don't realize our situation. Or at least if we do, that's going to cause the splitting. That's going to cause the shaking, which some people actually are going to leave. They will be saying, I am fine. Don't tell me that. I keep the law, I keep the Sabbath, I go to church on Sabbath, I pay tithe, but at the same time, they are deceiving themselves. Uh, here is a passage from Reviewing Herald, the magazine, August 7, 1894. And here it kind of explains what it constitutes wretchedness, the nakedness of those who feel rich and increase with goods. It is the want of the righteousness of Christ. So wretchedness it's actually have to include desire to have the righteousness of Christ. To, to be just not just covered, but it's really to live the life of Christ. And what um, Angela mentioned this morning, it's actually very applicable. Um, we're going to go to that a little later. It is the want of the righteousness of Christ. In their own righteousness, they are represented as clothed with filthy rags. And yet, in this condition, they flatter themselves that they are clothed upon with Christ's righteousness. Could deception be greater? As is represented by the prophet, they may be crying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, are we, which we know the Bible talks about that, that we are built into the, into the church like, um, in the, like a temple, while their hearts are filled with unholy traffic and unrighteous barter. The courts of the soul temple may be the haunt of envy, pride, passion, evil surmising, bitterness, and hollow formalism. Christ looks mournfully upon his professed people who feel rich and increased in the knowledge of the truth and who are yet destitute of the truth in life and character and unconscious of their destitute condition. So this is exactly the condition of the Church of Laodicea, which eventually is going to cause shaking, is going to cause a lot of people to leave because they wouldn't accept it. And um, I was looking for examples, and this came to mind about a really, um, when you think about it, that's really a self-deception, a form of self-deception that occurs in the Laodicean church, that we believe that we are well, we are right, but our characters or the things that we do um, don't really have, like we know from the time of Jesus, the fruits of the Spirit. We don't really have probably all of them. And this is maybe you've heard before story of the Dr. Ignace Semmelweis and the hand washing. Maybe you know the history. Uh, Dr. Semmelweis lived in around 1800s, 1840s. That uh, is actually the beginning uh, of that time. He discovered, uh, just in short, uh, that the the surgeons that were doing um, uh, uh, they were doing surgeries or they were delivering babies. They were going and doing autopsies, the doctors. And then after the autopsies, they go and deliver babies. And many women were dying from 
a fever. Uh, they were calling like a child bed fever, something. So the mothers were dying from fever because they didn't wash their hands. And uh, for from now to standpoint of today, we will say that's ridiculous. I mean, did that ever happen? Was that ever in history? Yeah, it was in the 1840s. And I don't know, I don't have details on the story how he discovered it, Moby just came up to it. So he invented or suggested, he tested different solutions. I think it was some with chlorine, kind of mixture of chlorine and water. And people, uh, he asked them and he tested whoever is willing, some of the surgeons to wash their hands and go and perform the, uh, the delivery of babies. And it happened that none of them died to the point that none of the mothers actually got this fever and died. And why it, this is a story of self-deception, and uh, I'm going to read you a, a, a few stories. It's, it's actually twofold. When you think about it, the first self-deception is from the doctors. They refused it. They, the, all the community, the doctor's community, the surgeons, they practically say because of their status, they will tell us, who are you to tell us what to do? I mean, obviously he was a doctor too, but so the doctors um, said that they were, they were offended that the suggestion that they were responsible for their patients' deaths. And they refused to believe that something as simple as hand washing can cause the death of their patients. And I'm not sure when the, uh, the oath of the doctors the, um, that they, they give you know, to serve, to be able to help the patient. Um, may probably it was, they already had it at the 1840s, uh, but they said, no, that's not possible. So they rejected it and continued practically killing mothers in that sense. So um, here in one of the uh, historical accounts is the status and the ego. At the time, doctors held a prestigious role in society. I mean, even in today, kind of, um, not after 2020. Somehow it almost became uh, dangerous to be a doctor anymore. But uh, all in the society, and many were unwilling to admit that their practice could be causing harm. The idea that esteemed professionals could be killing their patients was unthinkable to them. So they resisted this change, and it took another several decades before uh, Louis Pasteur and uh, I forgot the other doctor that uh, came up with the germ theory they realized that, oh, there are germs on surfaces. We need to really wash our hands. But why is double fold? Because Semmelweis, the doctor, also uh, received kind of his own self-deception that he believed, for example, that after the discovering uh, the effectiveness of hand washing, he became increasingly frustrated with the rejection of his ideas. Um, instead of systematically presenting the evidence and trying, you know, slowly to to sway a lot of people on his side, he became hostile, uh, alienated, and he, uh, as far as we know, he kind of died in, in, in oblivion. And at some point they say that he developed some sort of a martyr complex, uh, believing that only he alone held the truth. I mean, obviously it was working, but he started believing that only he alone held the truth and the entire medical establishment was against him. And uh, the problem really was his inability to communicate this to other people uh, and be able to uh, make it uh, popular. I mean, it still came in later, but a lot of a lot of mothers had to die, you know, for that time. So uh, the the concept here that we see, and you can I just pulled up a couple of definitions. It's a self-deception and cognitive dissonance, and why they go together. It's because when the person self-deceive himself, they go into this cognitive behavior that trying to prove that they are right, even that they are not. So uh, one of the definitions, self-deception and cognitive dissonance are closely related psychological concepts, both involving a person's internal struggle to reconcile conflicting beliefs, values, or behaviors. The connection between the two can be understood in terms of how individuals handle the discomfort caused by contradictions with, within their thinking or actions. So cognitive dissonance, and the thing is, this is so common, we just don't talk about that, but it exists almost any person 
has some form of uh, self-deception in something. Maybe we believe something that's wrong. So cognitive dissonance is the mental discomfort or tension that arises when a person holds two or more contradictory beliefs or values uh, or behavior simultaneously. This discomfort motivates the person to reduce the dissonance, usually by changing their beliefs or justifying their action or ignoring the, the true information that they have. For example, like you seen people that smoke maybe cigarettes and they say, but I just only smoke two cigarettes a day. They know that it's dangerous, but they try to justify it or people that are drinkers or they can say, I can quit at any time. But when they try to quit <coughs> after a week, they relapse back because there is an addiction going on. So self-deception definition occurs uh, that says it occurs when a person unconsciously convinces themselves of a false belief to avoid facing an uncomfortable truth. It allows the person to reduce the cognitive dissonance without necessarily facing reality. Instead of addressing the conflict, they deceive themselves to align their beliefs or behavior in a way that reduces psychological tension. So the conflicting ideas, and that's why I believe that I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychiatrist or anything, but, I, but to me, the situation of the Church of Laodicea is actually exactly that. It's suffering from self-deception and cognitive dissonance. It does really, it practically fits completely the definition. So um, another story I was thinking that it kind of introduced a lot the, the two type of wretchedness you can really see exactly, and we don't need to go through the whole parable. That's the parable of the prodigal son. And I only pulled the, the end of it uh, we can read all of it, but uh, in short, we know the prodigal son left his house. He wanted his in inheritance. This is the younger son. He went to a far country to practically spend everything. He lived a, a life of freedom and doing what he wants, practically wasting everything. And what happens is a famine comes. You can read that in Luke chapter 15. Famine comes in. He doesn't have any more money. He ends up working, a person actually gives him another person. I don't know if that was a friend, but all his friends flee away. He has to go and work on a farm. And the worst thing for a, for a Jew boy is to work on a pig farm. Because we know from the Bible, pigs are abomination to the Lord. And, but he has to go, and at some point he wants to eat the food that he gives to the pigs, but he was not allowed, if you read in the Bible. It says exactly that he was not allowed. Maybe he was probably trying to hide some to eat it. And then he realizes, why don't I go to my father? Even the servants in my father's house have enough food. Why am I suffering? So if you look at it, the younger son is having the same exact symptoms of being wretched. He becomes miserable, wretched. He realized that he, the only way to escape is just going back to his father. But the interesting situation to me is what I believe the actually the Church of Laodicea has is the older son. And here is the picture that I put is the father pleading with the older son who doesn't want to come in in the celebration where the younger son has arrived, has been given the new robe. He was clothed. He's given a ring to his finger. Um, it's really treated very well. And here, verses 28 to 30, 32 says, But he was angry and would not go in. That's the older son. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. And these exactly, especially verse 32, you can see that's again exactly the same description, kind of more broad about being wretched. The brother was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. But the older brother, what kind of wretchedness? Don't you think that he's having actually wretchedness, but he doesn't know it? Um, here is uh, uh, several quotes from Christ's Object Lessons. I only picked up the the good one. Now, if this brother is to share in the father's gifts, 
the elder son counts that that he himself has been wronged. He grudges his brother the favor shown him. He plainly shows that he had been in the father's place. He would not have received the prodigal. He does not even acknowledge him as a brother, but coldly speaks of him as thy son. So he doesn't say my brother, he says thy son, and he even practically says with his behavior that if he has come back, he's not going to accept it. And he's been living with the father. And this is another page from the same, uh, uh, the next page, this is the same chapter there. Yet the father deals tenderly with him. Son, he says, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Through all these years of your brother's outcast life, have you not had the privilege of companionship with me? And why I outline that, we're going to address a little bit. But you will see that um, I believe that the, this actual condition that the older son has is the same condition that the Church of Laodicea has. They've been in the presence of the Father, that, that we are always with Him, but we do not know the Father. Was the elder brother brought to see his own mean, ungrateful spirit? Did he come to see that though his brother had done wickedly, he was his brother still? Did the elder brother repent of his jealousy and hard-heartedness? Concerning this, Christ was silent, for the parable was still enacting and it rested with his hearers to determine what the outcome should be. And it's very interesting when Jesus told this parable, we know that uh, Israel, as a, as a people of, of God, have not been rejected yet. And there, wasn't, there was still time. So it's, it's almost like, in a sense, they were in the same situation in which the Church of Laodicea is today until the time of this message is given. So to me, is the message to the older brother is exactly the message to the church of Laodicea. Um, the older brother stayed with the father all the time. He worked for him, but he felt that he was a slave. He felt that keeping the commandments of, of the father or serving him was slaving to him. It wasn't a joy. And the, the, the very interesting thing is, it says here that, you had the privilege of companionship with me. That's what the father is telling him. Uh, one more, what greater deception can come upon human minds than a confidence that they are right when they are wrong? The message of the true witness finds the people of God in a sad deception, yet honest in this deception, which is, that's why I pull that uh, uh, cognitive dissonance. That's, that's you're being honest, but you are deceiving yourself. They know not that their condition is deplorable in the sight of God. While those addressed are flattering themselves that they are in an exalted spiritual condition, the message of the true witness breaks their security by the startling denunciation of their true situation of spiritual blindness, poverty, and wretchedness. The testimony so cutting and severe cannot be a mistake, for it is the true witness who speaks and his testimony must be correct. And uh, when we were at 3AB and uh, 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 I forgot who was preaching, but he says that you always have to end in a positive message. And they were referring to uh, Pastor Finley always ends up in a positive message. So to end up in a positive message, I mean, this is continuation of the, of the testimony of Jesus. And uh, I put Revelation 3.20. That's practically the end of this uh, kind of rebuke that Jesus does to the church of Laodicea. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And every time I read this verse, um, sometimes we elaborate that dinner or supper is the time that people uh, discuss. You can call potluck like we will have now. It's time to uh, to talk to each other. That's how you create relationship. But I always uh, also remember Luke 24, and that's the the two disciples which met Jesus to the, on the road to Emmaus. And I only put the verses that are kind of very interesting. Then they drew near to the village when they were going, 
and he indicated that he would have gone further that's jesus telling us that he needs to continue but they constrained him they practically i don't know pulled his hand and say abide with us for it is toward the evening and the day is far spent and he went in to stay with them and we know what they did they ate when he broke bread then they realized that's jesus and he poof disappeared he threw a, a magic trick on them uh, which is a miracle it's not magic but uh, he put a miracle but to me it's very interesting it's the concept of abiding i believe it's exactly the same the problem here is that they're calling jesus without even knowing that that was jesus to abide with them because he was revealing the prophecies and the truth about him dying and being resurrected and from the beginning it was saying of the scripture and this is what jesus is also doing to the laodicean church so uh, he really wants to come in and if he is outside that means he's not in uh, to me that's kind of the most startling thing is uh, if that's really true in everyone's life we have to change that and it's not about how many laws you keep or how good you follow the sabbath and all the other thing if you don't spend time with jesus if you don't say like the father said to the older brother uh, you have a companionship with me i've been with you always you don't remember you never had a conversation with me so i believe that's the problem of the church of laodicea and if that does not change we may face a difficult road ahead so my desire is to open let jesus come in and abide with us that's my desire amen, amen. amen. we will have a a song to uh, to finish and Can then we'll have a prayer please stand as we sing 309 <laughs> i surrender all 309 i surrender all <laughs> 